what happened after Blood, Sweat, and Tear? Where did you go from there? Because we lost touch, I think. I went on the road with Debbie Davies, the okay. blues guitarist, for a short tour. And while I was with her in Europe, I got called to go to London and do a Mike Scott record. And then when I got home, from that, you really want my entire life? Well, no. I, actually, Mike Scott, did, wasn't that the record you competed against Pino Palladino? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us the Pino story. Uh, well, I had to send Mike like three or four tapes. Steve Holly recommended me. And I had to oh. send Mike a bunch of tapes. And finally to the point, I was like, I don't know what else to send him, man. So I sent him a tape of me like bashing my bass into a wall with distortion pedals on and just going insane. Because that's part of my playing. I mean, I've done that, you know? I have a bunch of pedals. I love going crazy. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, you know, I don't know what else to send. So here, here's a very aggressive side. Mm -hmm. And that's when he called me. You wow. know? And they flew me from Paris, and I went over and did that and got fired. They, you know, the producer calls me, staying at a beautiful hotel in London, the Royal Garden, you know, it's like, Beautiful bathroom. I have this, you know, I get out of the tub and I'm listening to this uh, Los Lobos record, uh, Colossal Head. Yeah. Every, there's like a song on the record. I forget, like, everything's going my way. <laughs> and I'm singing to it, getting dressed. And they had a Jaguar with a chauffeur every day coming to pick me up. So I'm like, you know, this is like too good to be true. And I'll, I'm a complete waste of money as well. <laughs> so, so and a producer who will go unnamed calls me up, you know, like the, we rehearsed for a week and it was great. And we tracked for a day or two, I can't remember. And I, I get out of the bathtub and I'm like, everything's going my way. And the phone rings and it's, it's the producer. I'm bringing in Pino today. Don't go anywhere. Don't leave London, you're not fired yet. <coughs> and he hangs up. So they bring in Pino and uh, can I say this? You can say whatever you want. Pino whatever. sits down and starts rolling J's and gets blitzed. <laughs> and the sessions that were going from 10 to 5 or 6 had that day gone to like 2 or 3. And Mike canned them and then brought me back the next day. Okay. And then Mike was sitting behind the producer drawing pictures of the producer in a throne flying through the sky with a scepter and orb. <laughs> and they just weren't getting along. And then the whole thing got shit canned. And then he ended up making it with Pino and Keltner. Oh, wow. So if you're going to lose a record, lose it to Pino. <laughs> I still got paid. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Pino was at the height of his powers, and that's when everybody was using him, right? That, that yeah. Was, okay. Yeah. Well, it's not like he, everybody uses him now anyway. So. Yeah, he's, he's the guy of he's England, done. you know. Yeah. He's, he's big. yeah. And then uh, what, did you, you can't, what happened after that? Any, any other what thing? happened after that was the biggest transition maybe in my life. I come home. And my loft, I was living in Dumbo. Right. Uh, it was an illegal building, and there was a bunch of us living in these lofts. And the landlady said, do you want to buy it? So I said, sure, you know. It was really cheap. And I, I put out calls. I needed a gig. So I put out calls for a gig, for gigs, you know, to most people I knew. Like, I need a long gig. Like, on the road, I'll go anywhere. I just need to buy this place. I knew what was going to happen with Dumbo, you know. So anyway, the highest, the best paying gig I could get was as an MD for the New York, New York Casino in Las Vegas. Mm. They made a, street, uh, a show of, made up of street performers from New York. Many of them from the original Rockets, the breakdance. Okay. So it had some really cool things about it, but by and large it sucked. It was a fucking nightmare. It was <laughs> one year of nightmare. But I didn't gamble, and I didn't drink, and I didn't get into drugs, and I didn't jones out. Mm -hmm. Instead, I discovered poetry, which I had always enjoyed, mm -hmm. um, and listening to music again. Because I was out of town, and I didn't have to hustle for work. So I could sit down. I was working like three nights in a week. So I could sit down and enjoy records again. Mm -hmm. I mean, put on Elvis Costello record, or Tom Waits, somebody, and listen to it in its entirety like we did in our bedrooms, right. you know? And no pressure, phone ringing, you know. There was nothing else that was going to happen in Las Vegas for me. Mm. So I had all this time. And then uh, when I got returned to New York a year later, I quit playing for about a year, year and a half. Just said no to everything. Mm. And I was writing poetry, and I made 
a record. Yeah. I made my record of poems and music I'd composed with a bunch of different people on it. Yeah, who you had Yoko on it? No. You didn't, you didn't have Yoko on it? Deborah Harry and Kristen Hirsch. Mm -hmm. Robert Quine played guitar throughout the whole thing. Because I was in a band with Robert for a year and a half before I went to Vegas. Mm -hmm. And we became good friends. And uh, David Lowry from Cracker was on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, some other folks. Because uh, I, 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 I got sick of being a mercenary, man. Mm -hmm. I got sick of getting phone calls and just thinking, thank God, the fucking phone rang. Yes. Oh, you haven't said anything yet? <laughs> you know, I decided that's, that's no more. I'm not doing that, you know. I, I started playing, you know, you know, we all start playing. We have no idea what the business right. is about. Well, it took me a long time to hit me, and I just said, fuck it. I'm not doing this anymore, you know. I'm not, I'm not the guy for hire. Unless it's so astronomical, I can't say no. But... But you I want, have to also be in a position to be able to do that, right? I mean, that's, pardon me? You have to be in a position to be able to say no. I mean, obviously. Yeah, it's, and it's you know. Tough thing for if you for a lot of players, it's scary. Yeah, it's it's scary, but it's a ballsy move, yeah. and you only gain. You know, you have to put down. You have to draw a line somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just recently, this guy called me for a gig two weeks ago. For a Joe's Pub gig. Two nights, like a ton of rehearsals that were like six hours long for low bread. And I, I said no. I was like, well, why is it? And I said, you know, honestly, man, if I say yes to you, I guarantee my phone will ring within 48 hours. And you know what? It did <laughs> for a similar gig. And I said, you know, I just can't. Mm -hmm. You know, it's out there. It's that energy in the air. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm not fucking cheap. Mm -hmm. What I do is important. You know, I have value on it. I've put a lot of concern and care and compassion into how I approach the instrument. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll sit there and practice long notes all fucking day. When to let go, you know, when to touch it. I mean, you know, I love playing bass. I mean, I really love it. I'm not sick of it by any stretch. It's not a job. I love it. And whenever I play, I, I play. I mean, you'll hear mistakes, but I don't give a shit. <laughs> I really, I mean, no, I'm not going to disrespect somebody's song and fuck right, up. Right. But when given the opportunity, I will take risks. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, then I just learn something. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's a brave move. Now tell me what, uh, you, you play with high profile people, you play with Joan Baez. I was on the road with Joan for a few years, yeah. That must have been an extraordinary experience because now you're, you're playing a, a book that's, that's iconic, that's known around the world. It was, you know, it was, it, I learned a lot. I mean, she used to be on bills with lead belly and people like that. Yeah, I mean, that's and the drummer was really inexperienced. He didn't know who LeVon Helm was. And he used to bitch and moan. He goes, she plays bars of five, bars of seven, dropping beats, all this shit. I was like, man. She came up playing gigs with Lead Belly and people like that. That's who she listened to. Yeah. There were no, you know, that's what happened. <laughs> that's exactly when what they were ready to sing again, they started singing again. When they wanted to stop singing, you know, it's like you've got to go back and study the history, you know. So I would, she wouldn't talk much about it, yeah. but I would listen to her. But that's the greatest teacher. In other words, anybody could sit and read a chart and yeah. a lead sheet. But to actually play with someone who, like Joan Baez, when she feels like going up to the mic, she, she sings. And yeah. You've got to have a very sharp ear. A very what? A sharp ear. I mean, you have to be right you got to be on your toes yeah. and wait for those beats to move. Because mm -hmm. they did, like, almost every show. Yeah. Uh, but I loved it. Because yeah. I was like, this is real. Yeah. This is how she learned how to play. Yeah. And she played the big festivals, too. I mean, that must have been some experience. I played all the major festivals with her. Yeah. Nice. Drank a whole bottle of Claude Knobs JB. <laughs> Claude Knobs loved me. <laughs> and we were headlining. I said, Claude, man, you have any scotch? Come with me. <laughs> Takes me to his office, gives me a bottle, and literally, you know, I, I had to, like, cut some steam off. Because <laughs> at that point in the tour, I just wanted to go home. And uh, I didn't drink the entire bottle, but Claude walked in and had a good laugh when he saw, like, half of it gone. And I'm not a drinker, you know. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but, yeah, we played Nice and Montreux and... Cambridge and Glastonbury played all the major. I saw amazing things with her. 
That was a, that was a great experience. Uh, and it came to a proper conclusion. I had learned what I needed to learn and moved on. Did she, did you guys ever record together? I don't no. Even, you know. No. She had done a record uh, not long before I joined. I think she stopped recording by that point, I think. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, she's getting up there, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, we would do a gig and have to hang out four or five nights in one town. Problem was, she'd always want to stay in like the Rodeo Drive parts of town so she could shop because she was the millionaire. Yeah. And I'd walk out and be like, Jesus Christ, I can't eat for less than 50 euros. <laughs> so, so, yeah, uh, that, was a good, that, was a good, that was a good experience. But before that, you know, I was married and we had a son. And it's funny, you know, my mother-in-law, who's rather quite rude, when she found out we were pregnant, she goes, what will you do, Mike? I'm like, I'm going to fold, become an alcoholic and shoot heroin. I'm going to ignore my kid. I said, I'm going to fucking support my family. And then suddenly Broadway happened, you know. And I worked on there for a decade and subbed on tons and tons of shows. And what I got, shows got my own right? show. I subbed a lot on, well, they sound old now, but like The Full Monty and Aida, Rent, that Boy George show I can't remember the title of. Uh, just a ton of shit. You know, I actually had health insurance from the union because I was subbing on six books at once. Mm -hmm. Then I got my own book, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Okay. And um, that lasted about a year and a half. And then after that folded, I did the Joan tours. Mm -hmm. And since then, um, I've done various things, you know. I had a grant from the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council of this project I'm still working on. It's about, uh, it's hard, hard to explain. It's an animated film, the first animated cut up piece of film by this German woman. I forget her name now, shit. But anyway, I'm editing it out. It's about living with illness, you know, terminal okay. illness, and I'm writing the music and poems for it. Uh, and doing a lot of work with the producer Kevin Salem. Okay. It's a great producer, like foreign artist stuff for major labels across the pond mm -hmm. in Australia and what have you.